welcome to Technically Speaking, where scientists and engineers come together to chat about common interests, share knowledge and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Antonia and I'm joined by Jasmine and Ellie to talk about humans and whether they are the apex predator. Jasmine, you suggested this topic. You said you listened to a podcast and thought it would make a fun discussion. Yeah, so I was listening to a podcast by The Guardian and they had on a scientist who'd recently published some work on some research that they'd done comparing responses of different animals at a watering hole in Africa. So they played clips of different noises. They did typical predator noises like lion roaring, other animals that you would find in the savannah. And and the interesting thing result is the sound that made the most animals run away, but also made the animals run away in the quickest time was actually human human noises. One conclusion that you could draw from that research is that humans are the apex predator because um, animals are just scared of us more than a lion. And I thought what was interesting was they compared humans talking versus humans hunting. So they had gunshots and dogs barking. And it was the talking that got them more scared. Yeah, well, if you can hear humans talking, there's a chance that you can run away before they shoot you. If you hear a gunshot, it's a bit too late. Usually it indicates someone's been shot. Hmm. So Ellie, as a animal lover and a zoologist graduate, what's your take on this? Having humans as the apex predator makes sense in a lot of ways, but also in a lot of ways... We're really not. I think there's so many animals that are far, far better suited to being uh, the apex predator of their environments, which we're going to definitely talk more about. I think that is interesting what you said about the savannah, uh, like fear response uh, from animals. But I think it also shows how smart they are. Like they've clearly learned that this sort of foreign enemy in their environment is worth staying away from. And potentially if they, you know, they hear the noises, they hear the voices, they leg it. They've survived then for another day. And then who's to say that they haven't snuck round behind your vehicle or your, you know, party. And they're going to now, you know, take you, drag you off into the bush because they've learned, you know, about everything like that. So I think it's really interesting. And I think largely I probably hold the position that we are not the apex predator but I'm interested to discuss it more. Okay, early conclusions. You said something rather specific there, Ellie, about being the apex predator of their environment. Could you expand on that more? Yeah, so we should probably define what we mean by apex predator in the first place. So I would say that an apex predator is an animal that has no natural predators of their own in their environment and therefore is at the top of the food chain. So they're like the highest in terms of these, what we call like trophic levels. Everyone gets taught in school, you know, the grass is one level and then the little mouse eats the grass. And then the apex predator in that instance could be like a barn owl that would come in and eat the mouse. And that's like very basic each stage of the trophic levels. Yeah, so apex predators are at the top and there's nothing above them. What about predator themselves though? Again, in those trophic levels, it gets more complicated. Like the more you learn you learn that, okay, the mouse is eaten by the barn owl, but the mouse is also eaten by something like a fox or something, I'm trying to think of something else that would eat a mouse and then be eaten again. Do you see what I mean? Maybe like a vulture? Because is that a, kind of a scavenger? Yeah, I guess so. So if it was a bigger animal, if we go back to the savannah, let's say a lion killed a antelope, but equally a leopard could have killed that antelope or a leopard would then come and scavenge, or a hyena would come and scavenge, and then vultures would come in. So it's much, much more interconnected. And there's much more, instead of just one thing eats another thing eats another thing, there's branches and webs coming out of all these levels. So a predator can be eating another animal in that ecosystem, but it doesn't necessarily mean that another animal isn't going to come and eat it if it gets a chance, or that there isn't more things at play. And any, like, lots of predators, you read in the textbooks, oh, lions eat antelope. But lions will probably eat anything they can get their hands on, if it's worth it or if it's injured or, you know, whatever. So there's more more nuance to it there. Do you think hunting specifically is a predator um, behaviour? Because, you know, we talked about some of the other animals that might happen to eat something because it's already dead. Yeah. 
But were they necessarily a predator or are they just a carnivore or an omnivore? In zoology terms, I would say predators usually would hunt and kill their prey items. Like a, a vulture, I wouldn't technically class as a predator because it's a scavenger first and foremost. It's not actively killing another creature. They're like animals who are omnivores, but they don't hunt, they just scavenge. So like panda bears, no one would say they're a predator, but they are omnivores. And if they do come across like a dead animal, they will eat it. Yeah, lots of animals are opportunistic. Yeah. So if they find something that's already dead. Pigs as well, they'll eat other dead pigs if there just happens to be a dead pig. Yeah. But we also think about predators as kind of aggressive animals. Does that also include organisms that I might kill, but not necessarily eat what they've killed? We were considering how mosquitoes are great at carrying disease, but I don't think they're trying to kill people to eat, but they kind of feed off them. I know what you mean. There's an interesting one about mosquitoes because, yes, by carrying malaria and other diseases, they kill far more people per year than a lion or a shark or anything like that. But in terms of how we defined apex predator... Lots of things eat mosquitoes, bats, birds, geckos, lizards, all things like that. So I, in terms of numbers of death, they're probably easily the highest. But in terms of being an apex predator, I don't think you could class them in the same way because they get eaten probably all the time. Well, largely. And also they don't live very long. I feel like they're just not, they're not as cool as like a polar bear or a great white shark. Or something like that. Like, you have to have a bit of badass part of your persona, I reckon, to be a true apex predator. And a mosquito is just... Like, I could I could kill a mosquito. It surely can't be an apex predator. It's deadly, but not a predator. Not because it's a mosquito, more because, like, it just happens to carry around something that can kill lots of people. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a byproduct. It's like rats and the Black Plague. Yeah, exactly. Like, rats... Realistically, I could probably kill a rat if I had to. I wouldn't want to. But yeah, the Black Pig, it was just because it was it was on the fleas, wasn't it, or something? Yeah, it was on the fleas. Yeah, which again, is like the mosquito thing, like tiny insects <laughs> transmitting diseases that yeah. kill lots of people doesn't mean they're apex predators. They're just annoying. So talking about if you had to kill a mouse, you probably could. There comes this like argument of hierarchy. Like, at what point would you say is the cut-off that you could beat another animal if you had to about humans <laughs> what you reckon you could kill another person i mean people do kill other people so i mean yeah it's like strength isn't it because there's no way i'm beating a tiger a polar bear a great white shark i've just i'm instantly me on my own in their environment i've got no chance but what about our environment what's our environment then is it the built environment well i think if i had a great white shark in the streets of cambridge i'd I'd probably be okay. I think I might win that one. Just walk away. But even a polar bear. Even a polar bear in Cambridge, I don't think I, I wouldn't win. You just wait. <laughs> but it's like why people panic when like stuff escapes from zoos and circuses. Because realistically, they could kill you, even in your village or your environment. So, sounds like we're not the apex predator in that case. But then, I guess you have to bring in like intelligence into it as well, because... Killer whales are crazy intelligent, but then in the same way humans have used their own intelligence to create things like guns and knives and nuclear weapons. Or even just traps. Yeah. So then if you're arming me with some... I mean, I don't because I would have no idea how to use it, but (laughs) if you're arming me against a polar bear with a gun, I'm going to have more of a chance, aren't I? Yeah, but I would add that. Killer whales are also, like, massive, really strong, and really fast, and have really sharp teeth. <laughs> All of that is true. Yeah, I'm not beating a killer whale. Yeah. Especially in the water, I don't think my gun will work. I don't know anything about guns. Based on brute strength, you're not beating a killer whale, because it will. It just has to sit on you and you're dead. <laughs> what, so, like, squashability is now a factor. Yep. But it's all, this is, like, common, right? You're seeing the theme between all these apex predators is that They're larger, equipped to kill things. They've got big teeth, they've got big claws, they've got muscle. They're really strong. They've got more intelligence. Like it, it, you can see it mapped out across, you know, the Arctic, the jungle, the savannah. It becomes, becomes easy to see why these animals are at the top of the food chain. So what used to eat humans? A lot of animals. Yeah, but is there any like animal which evolved to eat 
us as a species and they kind of expect it? Or do you think we've wiped them all out? We basically wiped them all out because we invented weapons. So, like, things that did <laughs> hunt us, we either killed them to extinction or made sure that they knew to be scared of us. Yeah, I think that's true. Like, we wiped out wolves from the yep. UK. And bears. And bears and lynx, which I don't know necessarily a lynx would have taken a human, but it would have taken... A small child. A small child would have taken a small child. <laughs> If it got to us before we became big enough. Yeah, before you reached adulthood, it could have taken you. Also, like, large birds of prey, like, can genuinely, like, pick up a small child. Because that does happen. Because they can also pick up small dogs. I think small dogs are still smaller than most home and children, though. Yeah, small dogs is quite common. Like, chihuahuas. A baby. But not, you know, the large eagles that were in um, Lord of the Rings. No, I mean, if they existed, they could, like, definitely hunt humans. Oh, there was a large eagle that existed in uh, Fossil Record. It's really cool. Oh, I can't remember what it was called. But it had, like, a 12-foot wingspan or something. So, like, it was really big. Wow. Really big. Uh, And I think we, like, when we wrote the article, I think we theorised that it probably could have lifted Frodo. (laughs) (laughs) Frodo's really small, though. Yeah, well, true, but... We need it to lift Gandalf, and then we can say, yes, it can lift humans. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, hang on, this is it. Uh, A 60,000-year-old eagle with three-metre wingspan probably could have lifted Frodo. So it's not, realistically, it's not even that long ago, 60,000 years. Yeah. 9.8 9.8 feet for anyone who prefers feet to meters. And we can all agree that dinosaurs, at least the predatory dinosaurs, if they exist coexisted with humans, they definitely would have hunted us and we would have been easy prey because... We're so small. Well... And slow. And we have no weapons. <laughs> <laughs> I think they say the only thing you can outcompete an animal on is stamina because we're really sh- slow across short distances compared to most of the animal kingdom. We're terrible at climbing compared to most of the animal kingdom. <laughs> we can't fly. We can't fly, we can't really swim that far, realistically. But the only thing we can do well is run long distances slowly. So, like, our stamina compared to pretty much anything else. Like, people do ultra marathons and ultra, ultra marathons because we're really good at running slowly for a long time. Like, you can, obviously, you have to train, but that's, like, inbuilt into people. Is that because we're, like, we're a migratory species, evolutionary-wise? Yeah, I don't know really where that comes from. I think probably the lack of being good at anything else that was what was left over. I thought we it was just our big brains that helped us compared to any phys- other physical attribute. I think the brain does help, but you need other physical attributes because otherwise you're still going to be easy prey. I mean, the brain has led to the invention of, you know, all these weapons and complex technologies that would help you in that situation. So you definitely can't count out intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so talking about our big brains and our ability to create things, we've also managed to create quite a lot of weaponry. And you said earlier we wiped out quite a few species in the UK. I think you also had the statistic about how uh, what percentage of like species we've wiped out or made extinct. So the exact figure is pretty difficult because when you need when you talk about percentage of species, one key component is how many species there are, and we're always discovering new species every single year. So that makes it really difficult to actually quantify. And some figures have it that we've actually killed species that we didn't actually know existed. So quite difficult. But there's some estimates for like different types of species. I'm just going to go off of what a UN report has found in terms of like species that are now threatened with extinction rather than made extinct for a bit more certainty. Currently, there are over 157,000 species that are at the risk of extinction, including 41% of amphibians, 37% of sharks and, and rays, 36% of reef building corals. This includes like non-animal species. 26% are mammals and 12% are birds. Is it bad that I thought that would be higher? Which is terrible. Some figures do have it higher. It depends a lot on how you want to count species. Yeah, fair. Another source said there's around 1 million animal and plant species that are now threatened with extinction within the next... It also depends on like what time frame you're considering. So if you like consider a shorter time period, then it's going to be a smaller number than if you consider like decades. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Across the world, we've caused a lot of issues in terms of like wiping out species like because we killed foxes not foxes uh, wolves bears all that sort of thing that were like a threat to us but then also we like ate a lot of stuff to extinction as well didn't we because we like ate the dodo to extinction we didn't eat it to extinction when humans first arrived in australia 
there were giant sloths, basically because we destroyed their habitat, they're now extinct. But we now have their smaller cousin, the regular sloth. It's like New Zealand as well, isn't it? Like those island nations, you can see there's no apex predator on New Zealand because they evolved in isolation. All the flightless birds. Yeah, exactly. Flightless birds. They didn't need to fly to get away from predators. So they became flightless, which is, I mean, now terrible because we've introduced rats and cats and all of that sort of thing and they get wiped out. But is so fascinating in terms of the ecology because... There isn't a big predatory animal that was going around eating all these things. So they didn't have that sort of evolutionary arms race to develop defences to get away from them. And now all the little kiwis are small and defenceless, but so, so cute. And the wombats and the koalas, although they're not birds, but all these defenceless cute animals that have no predator. Would the Tasmanian devil be counted as a predator? Because I think they hunt. They'll be like the closest thing to an apex predator. Well, it's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head what their diet would be. They're quite small, is the only thing. They are small. But they're ferocious. I think they probably eat mice and rats and birds' eggs and stuff like that, but I I couldn't tell you for sure. But yeah, it's what eats them, right? So what's going to eat a Tasmanian yeah. devil? And I, I don't think there's much. What's the biggest thing in New Zealand? I would kind of assume it'd be whatever's the biggest. In New Zealand, mm. uh, seals, probably, in terms of body mass. Uh, but on land, nothing. There, well, now there's possums, which are a pest, but there's nothing There's nothing big in New Zealand. I love how small everything is. I mean, I guess it makes sense for a small island to not have been big enough to build such an animal. Yeah, there's like a thing. It might even just be called island theory, but it's very much so that either everything in your island goes tiny or everything in your island goes big. It's like a weird biological phenomenon. But yeah, you can see how having no apex predators just makes you defenseless because you why would you waste the energy on like defending why would you then select for that because it's not increasing your survival. So you just you'd eventually it would just phase out. So if everything tends towards to get bigger, what happened to the woolly mammoth? Because you'd think that they like had a lot of natural defense against A the cold. And then anything trying to eat it, I feel like would just get the hair just stuck in their teeth and they're probably just tangled <laughs> and then you know by that point the woolly mammoths probably run off i don't actually know really what happened to the woolly mammoth did we as a prehistoric human race kill it off because things like big big animals that aren't predators are interesting like elephants as the closest living relative to mammoths they are not predators because they eat largely leaves and berries and bark and that sort of thing. But they are massive. So then you have a natural inbuilt defence because you're three times, ten times, twenty times bigger than things that are going to eat you. But then also that's where like pack hunting comes in. So like mm. a lion alone wouldn't take on an elephant or a giraffe necessarily. But a pack or a pride of lions would potentially take an older giraffe or a more injured giraffe because then the odds are more in their favour. I'd be surprised if lions would take an elephant, but then if it was old and on its way out anyway, they could just badger it until <laughs> it collapsed, I suppose. Exhaustion is a technique that lots of animals use, especially wolves. They will run an animal into the ground because they've got the stanima. So, yeah, I think those are interesting. Penguins and seals are more agile than a killer whale would be, especially in water, and that's probably their biggest defence is that they are smaller but quicker. And so if they could get to an iceberg or get to land, they'd have more of a chance. Exhaustion can be a thing, and also killer whales are so clever that they would, like, surround it on an iceberg, and then it would be scared and panic and all the rest of it. I suppose those kind of creatures have benefit from being on land as well as in sea. Whereas the killer whale is just in the sea. There's a reason seals breed on land, right? Because the pups are so vulnerable that having them on land would take them away from something like a killer whale. So, because we're causing climate change and it's exhausting habitats, does that make us apex predator? Because we've basically used the exhaustion to a high extreme. I mean, we're wiping out habitats. We're killing stuff anyway. We have lots of weapons and means to destroy land and people and animals on that land so i mean yeah you could definitely argue you could definitely argue that 
and we have accelerated climate change to ridiculous levels like humans the human race is to blame for that so yeah i think in terms of wiping stuff out we are probably probably the worst ones aren't we bigger than the asteroid do you think oh space is the apex predator no one saw that one coming (laughs) i would argue that the asteroid was chance in the same way that getting malaria by a mosquito is sort of chance because that asteroid is not actively hunting the human race. I mean, maybe it was sent by aliens, who knows? But, <laughs> you know, it, that was just unfortunate cosmic incident rather than an apex predator wiping them out. But if you're talking about extinction on a huge level, then that asteroid is surely, surely at the top of the list in one single blow. Do you think there is another predator waiting out in space for us, though? Ooh... Could be. Why not? It might not be big, but again, I know we kind of ruled out small creatures and organisms being apex predators because they're not trying to kill us. But what if they create such uninhabitable space for us that they overtake our planet or something? You mean like zombie sort of Last of Us style, something escapes from a lab and wipes out everyone and takes over and then the planet becomes uninhabitable? Yeah. How long could we last before we wiped ourselves out? If we are positioning human race as the apex predator of Earth, do we, like, eventually, we wipe out everything else, right? By greed or, you know, human population is so large, we need crops, we need food, blah, blah, blah. We wipe out everything, let's say. Eventually, do we just destroy ourselves? Should we leave it there? I think maybe we should. (laughs) Yeah. Did we come to a conclusion about if a human is or isn't the apex predator? I'm still on no, but I think I'm an optimist. (laughs) Or mainly on the side of the animals. But there we go. That's all we have time for. (laughs) Thanks for listening. The views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.